As Rachel said, I'm Robin Chandler, and I'm an associate university librarian uh, for digital library and assessment at UC Santa Cruz. Um, and I had uh, some involvement with the Grateful Dead Archive Online, as uh, has been alluded to earlier today. But uh, this afternoon, my great pleasure is to introduce uh, Dr. Patrick Marie John, who we're so happy to have with us here. Patrick is the Research Assistant Professor and Omeka Developer Manager at the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media at George Mason University. He has a Bachelor's in Science in Mathematics from Iowa State University and a MA in English Literature and a PhD in Anglo-Saxon Literature, both from the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Besides helping to develop Omeka, he uses Omeka and other tools to experiment with making data part of public humanities projects. And a recent project of his, the US Museums Explorer, an Omeka, an Omeka on-site built on data released by the Institute for Museum and Library Services, was recently cited as an example of using open data in the Center for the Future of Museums in Trends Watch 2015. Patrick's talk this afternoon will focus on how can you tailor your Omeka site and why. So please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you everybody for coming out here today. This is uh, wonderful to see so many people doing interesting and creative things with Omeka, even if some of those interesting creative things are just starting to think, I wonder what I could do with Omeka. I, uh, <clears throat> I had some, some planned remarks about how to customize and tailor your Omeka sites, talking a little technically about the views and how to change the appearance, the plugins that Ned mentioned and how to change that functionality, uh, different ways to hack around into the code of Omeka. However, after hearing all of the wonderful different kinds of projects that you all spoke about this morning, I was sort of reminded of a much more fundamental and important way to start thinking about how to tailor your Omeka site. And that basically comes down to a question that we actually fairly frequently talk about around the Omeka dev table. This is the question of, just what the heck is Omeka anyway? Uh, it's sort of very open into, into uh, interpretation. The answer we come up with most frequently and sort of fall back to at the dev table is it's, it's just a bucket to put your shit in. Um, <laughs> simple enough, but doesn't quite do justice to all the wonderful things that we've seen this morning. Much of this is by design that we do want Omeka to be very open to interpretation of what this is anyway. And we saw a little bit of this in how people were describing how they put their sites together. Uh, so for example, uh, we have this idea of an item in Omeka, and this item might refer to person or a place or an idea or a thing, basically an item can be just about anything you need it to be in Omeka. And this leads to one type of Omeka site that we often see, sort of the item-centric site, which focuses on here's the list of items, here's the visual or video or audio representations of it. Here's all of the beautiful metadata about it. And you want to browse through and look at the items, whatever, uh, whatever item might mean for that item-centric site. Uh, there was also great conversation about what an exhibit is in Omeka. And this sort of leads to a different type of Omeka site, the exhibit focus site, which is more about that narrative description, it's more prosy, it brings in these items and puts them into some kind of context with each other. But again, what an exhibit actually is, uh, as we heard, leads 
very quickly into very interesting, more fundamental questions. Is it a linear argument? Is it a argument that's sort of linear, but not really linear, so you can sort of insert yourself any place that you want? Is it trying to create some kind of completely new and different visual argument as opposed to the text-based argument? Um, it's also interesting in the word we use for that, exhibit. This is sort of a, a throwback metaphor to some of the original uses of Omeka that were, you're a small museum and you want to put your museum collections online. Well, if this is sort of an online analogy or an extension of a museum, well then exhibit there isn't that prose narrative. It's sort of the, you walk into one room and that's part of the exhibit and it has different items in it. And then you move on to another room and that has a different collection of items and that makes it a very different exhibit. So sort of very much not the narrative prose model, but instead trying to recreate online this uh, uh, physical and experiential model. So here again, just like the item can be a whole lot of different things, an exhibit can also be a whole lot of very different things depending on sort of what you need it to do. So the upshot is that that first step of how do I tailor or customize my Omeka site is really to do the very non-technical work of figuring out what is an item in my site anyway? What is an exhibit in my site anyway? Uh, do I need exhibits at all? Uh, if I say that an item is a person, what other additional metadata do I need to create or think about in some way? So this um, idea of customizing a site really does come down to some of the good intellectual work we heard examples of this morning of what is the mission of this site? Um, what do I want my different audiences to get out of this site? Once you start thinking through some of those things, then that's when you can start thinking about more of the administrative or technical details. Okay, so Omeka now provides some, some pretty good tools for customizing the navigation. So you can sort of separate, is this an exhibit-based site or is this a item-based site? Um, you can do a lot of things with that, but maybe not everything. And this leads you to the next question of um, what kinds of hacking or coding might I need to do? Can I just ask the question on the Omeka forums and this will just get me over that tiny hump that I need? Or do I have to go and beg Ned for some of his time to figure out some new functionality that doesn't already exist? Like, is there something about an item in Omeka that is essential to my project but requires new functionality? Okay, this is where you uh, come to the kind of plugin that Ned was mentioning that does extend that functionality. Some things can be done easily, some things a little bit more complicated, um, but lots is available there. Maybe this also leads to learning a bit of code. Eh, maybe not, maybe this turns into your first experiment with code. Uh, again, depends on the idea of the item. Same with exhibit, we've recently built in some nifty features for people to create exhibits in different ways. So we've gone from the page looking like a big, like complete page, and you have just a few templates to choose from, into having different kinds of content blocks for each exhibit page. Okay. Maybe those content blocks and their structure and format fit with your conception of an exhibit. Maybe they don't. 
uh, here again, this is where you start to think, what do I need to create on those Omeka pages that actually fits with the intellectual goals that I'm going for? And yeah, then you might have to start looking for what kinds of plugins do I need to write? So I think that sort of response to, again, to the beautiful work that I see happening here is your first step to thinking about how do I customize Omeka? Figure out what kinds of buckets you are creating and what that means for the functionality of the site. Do you need to just change the appearance, work with a theme, or change the functionality? The second question, though, I think gets even more fun. And here I, I happily get to return to some of the things that I did actually pre prepare for uh, this bit of the talk. Why to customize Omeka? This here is probably the best answer to that question that I have ever seen. Why customize Omeka? Well, because students' ideas were always pushing up against the limits of the software. This is exactly as it should be. This, I mean, Omeka will always have limitations based on those individual needs. But think about how happy we get when the students' ideas start to push up other technologies of the classroom. Students' ideas were always bumping up the limits of the footnotes in my Norton anthology for the class. Students' ideas were always bumping up the limits of the five-page paper that I had assigned. That's a happy thing. Hopefully that means they'll take a more advanced class later on. Students' ideas were always bumping up against the limits of the quarter or semester system. I can suspect that some of the faculty's ideas also bump up against those same limits. This is exciting stuff. This is where we have sort of a technology and a practice and uh, classroom activities that are fostering more and more thought from students and teachers. I completely envy the faculty who have students that are doing this. And I completely envy the students who get to be in these classes where this sort of activity is taking place. Uh, talk a lot from the uh, uh, Okinawa project about definitely pushing the boundaries, hitting limits there. Uh, Ray mentioned the uh, limits of the character encoding. Uh, the Japanese characters aren't coming out quite right. But the more conceptual limits, um, again, this sort of echoes back to what is an item, what is Omeka. These are the places where you get to think, sort of putting into comparison, what can I do with this software? What do I want to do? And how do I start to, to bridge those differences? So the... Um, this notion of, of the how and the why should always be sort of going back and forth against each other. Uh, sometimes this will happen through an iteration of courses. Uh, so maybe one course, you have everything you need in the basic free Omeka.net, and then in a course like that, you will discover, ooh, there's this really neat idea that keeps coming up that just doesn't quite fit into those limitations. Yeah, this is healthy. Maybe this means ne the next course iteration, you bump up to a paid plan on Omeka.net to uh, take advantage of some of the more complex plugins that are available there. Or maybe this means that you think there's a plugin that exists, but it isn't available on Omeka.net, 
So maybe this means that your modification of Omeka means moving from Omeka.net to the Omeka standalone version, uh, where you host it yourself, but can do whatever you want with it. Uh, that's, that's a leap, I understand, because then you sort of have to take much more responsibility for what's happening there. Omeka.net is great because something happens on the server, that's not your problem, that, that's our problem to figure out. Take on that responsibility of hosting it yourself and you're in the world of, okay, I've got to call tech support, maybe the library is hosting it, and you have a, a agreement there about what the library can and cannot do. Maybe you're hosting it yourself and that means you have to learn how to talk to the folks at Bluehost or reclaim hosting about how to get this problem solved. It sort of expands out your possibilities, both for the how, the what you can do to customize Omeka, and expands out your ability to tackle this kind of question directly. That gives you more control of where you set those limits for your course and gives you more control for your options to address those limits. Uh, very powerful stuff as a teacher. This is sort of a technology that you have more control over uh, possibly as a teacher than lots of these other uh, classroom materials. It's hard to change the content and structure of that Norton anthology. <laughs> but if you want to take on the challenge, yeah, you can do things to change the content and structure of this software to make it part of uh, your intellectual materials that you bring to whatever course you're teaching. No, I think that's that's sort of condensed version of of what I wanted to say about this and allow time for questions. Mm. Uh oh, where'd it go? Mm. Ooh, ouch. Um, yeah, uh, question is, what do I see as the future direction of Omeka, short term and long term? Uh, so, uh, first, uh, the short term, uh, continued plugin development, responding to different kinds of needs. Hopefully, part of what, what I'm trying to get more and more into my job is, Events like this, and especially events that connect with developers, to uh, get at exactly what Ned was talking about. Try to bring up more of these plugins and themes that people will find useful. One of the limits that I, I bump into as a developer is that what we can do at the center is very much constrained. As I'm sure this is similar here too, constrained by what's in the grant. Um, and grants tend to fund big, powerful plugins. I'm hoping that with some uh, uh, more support, a little bit more interaction, some of the little teeny tiny plugins that we'd like, 
we can get more of the community to produce. Um, there are, for example, questions that come into the forums that we think, you know, somebody could probably whip that up in about two weekends. But who wants to uh, donate those weekends and it's not gonna be a grant? But people are out there in the world solving these problems. That's something that I'd like to see happen more and more for the Omeka 2 series uh, to hit on it, more ways that, that we're addressing that problem. Long term, uh, some of you might have heard of a thing called Omeka S, which is sort of a complete rewrite of Omeka that will exist in parallel to Omeka 2 for a while. Its purpose is sort of twofold. Um, one is it is designed specifically for institutions and libraries uh, so that when a professor comes and wants to spin up a new Omeka site, it won't be a completely new installation. It'll be a little bit like WordPress multi-site is. Significant differences, uh, but that sort of uh, infrastructure need, that's one thing it's addressing. Also, that will be building in, hopefully, much better and easier ways to connect to other systems. So connect to uh, Fedora, DSpace, this will also uh, make the like, content DM connections happen. That interconnectedness uh, and linked open data stuff is the other aspect of it. So that's, that's the big stuff. That was a perfect setup for my question. Very exciting. <laughs> Excellent. Um, as you've probably ferreted out by now, I work on the IT side of the house, and mm -hmm. so I'm always interested in the support questions because sort of, you know, people have these great ideas and they put stuff together, but, you know, these digital projects have very long legs and legacies, yeah. and so sort of how do we take care of them and what's the care in feeding the code base? And so mm -hmm. when you look at this, I'm thinking about what happened with Sakai, for example. When you talk about your um, Omeka uh, S... Mm -hmm. um, so what happens to all of the plugins that have been developed for Omeka 2 and how do you see mm -hmm. sort of that, um, how do we can, you know, when people have, have really figured out what they needed to do to tailor, mm -hmm. how do we sort of keep those sites healthy and strong? Mm -hmm. um, and, how, and, and can you talk a little bit about your ideas around right-sizing infrastructure so that, in, right. that, so that the institutional support is viable? Mm -hmm. uh, this is part of why I mentioned that Omeka 2 and Omeka S will sort of run in parallel because as we really got deep into the development, they became sort of two completely different things. Um, so it's not like Omeka S is really just a clever renaming of Omeka 3. No, it, that naming reflects the difference, and so we're going to have to maintain those together for a while. Um, and so there's, there's going to be that choice of... Do I start with the brand new stuff uh, in Omeka S? Or do I want to keep my Omeka 2 site just going along okay? Right. Well, the, the Omeka 2 would probably uh, make more sense, not for an institutional setup, but for like individuals or a single a museum or society that just has their, their one site, they put it up in two, and that'll keep going on for a while. Um, that bigger question of support and keeping things going. Ugh. Um, hopefully, um, this process of um, removing some of that time of installing new stuff in a happy unicorn-filled world, that will be, okay, time for a little bit of more of that maintenance work. But really, in general, this is a question that I'm not going to claim to provide a good answer for. This is an issue all over the digital humanities. Right, no, it's not, it's not exclusive to Omeka at all. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so we see beautiful sites 
Well, okay, beautiful sites that were beautiful 10 years ago. Uh, <laughs> this, this is one of the main issues. Um, where would funding for that come from? Well, you can't get a grant to update a site usually. This is looking for what is the institutional investment to uh, make that happen, or what is the institutional decision to say this site will not be maintained after three years or five years. We will archive it however we can and say, that's done. I'm, I'm actually comfortable with that. Um, it's a hard decision, it has to be made. It's not a bad solution. Some other questions for Patrick? Okay, well, thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you.